Welcome, everybody. I'm Glenn Cohen. I'm a professor here at Harvard Law School, and I'm so glad today to be joined by Rochelle Walensky, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the 19th director of the CDC, who's been joining us this year at Harvard. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. I've been delighted. I've had so much fun this semester. So thank you for sitting down with us today to talk a little bit about the life you've led before the CDC, but also the life at the CDC and the life <laughs> after the CDC, these three distinct um, kinds of periods. I wonder if you could tell us, tell us a little bit about what you did before the CDC and how that got you kind of noticed for that job. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I will say 1991, I won't be in such detail, but in 1991, I was a med student when I remember poring over the newspaper, but Magic had HIV. Magic Johnson had HIV. 1995, I was a house officer and everybody we admitted in that intern year was dying of AIDS. And actually it was that year, December of 1995, that the cocktail became available. And I was, I was hooked on being an HIV doc. That's what I wanted to do. And what you saw was the, this intersection of really critical science that was happening, new and novel therapies that potentially gave people a lifetime ahead of them when they you know, had been otherwise had a death sentence, and um, these social vulnerabilities that where everybody didn't have access. And so I became an HIV doc, and my research actually was an HIV policy and cost effectiveness of how we um, bring people who don't have resources into retroviral therapy and other HIV-related prevention interventions. Um, so that was really what my career was. I was working in the field of cost effectiveness, both in the United States and abroad. And in 2017, I became the chief of infectious diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital. Then 2019, of course, first cases of Wuhan in China, um, well, of SARS-CoV-2. And um, so was really sitting as the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases when we had our first cases here in the state on March 6th um, and spent that first year working with a division that was completely dedicated um, during really challenging hard times of our first year of COVID. I mean, what an amazing story to be there really on the front lines, as you say. Um, you know, the switch from being on the front lines to policy. I'm curious if you could say a little bit about when you were on the front line. We'll get to the policy part first. How you thought about the policy making process and what it looked like to you from the outside. Um, well, I, you know, on the, from the front lines, I was managing the division and there was a lot that we had to do on the policy front as well. We were invoking crisis standards of care and thinking about that, what was that going to look like? We had been given a, a, a um, handful of remdesivir, but we had way more patients than we um, could, you, could use all the remdesivir for. Um, we had to think about masking policy in the hospital when we weren't sure that we had enough masks to actually create a masking policy. So it was a microcosm of what we needed to do for the country. One of the things that we did as a chief of ID and chief across um, all the different systems in Massachusetts was to come together every week on Thursdays and, and sit down and say, what's happening in your hospital? What's happening in your hospital? What are the policy and challenges that you're facing? Um, so that we can kind of trade secrets and, and see what everybody else was challenged with. We wrote numerous op-eds together as the division chiefs of infectious diseases across the state to sort of have a unified message of what the people of Massachusetts should be doing. And that was actually something that um, I think was really important to the state and something that I took with me to CDC. Of course, um, and that first year was, you know, not being director of the CDC, but it was one of those most challenging years because there was so much uncertainty. You were seeing your colleagues as patients in the ICU. It was really, really a scary time. It was pre-vaccine. We didn't know when and if a vaccine was coming and how good it would be. Um, from the CDC lens, um, it was a much larger scale. Um, and um, the diversity of those who you had to care for um, was very different. We were caring for people across the United States. There were global health issues that were involved. There were regulatory things that we were in charge of. Um, and creating policy for a country that is so markedly diverse in what they need, what they want, and what resources they have was really um, among the biggest challenges. So you're here in Massachusetts. 
you're dealing with this crisis on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And then there's this moment of transition to Washington, right? So first of all, just tell us what that call felt like when you got the call, but also tell us a little bit how you think you got on the radar of the people making the decision to fill the CDC director slot. Right. So in my work um, previously, I had done a lot of work in HIV policy. Um, I had done a lot of work in thinking about how we blanket the resources that we have, limited resources that we have, especially among those who are socially vulnerable and advocating for those resources in an economically efficient way. That was the work that I did. Um, through that work, I had gotten to know Dr. Fauci um, and had worked closely with him and, and had been um, in touch with him when there were certain HIV-related policies um, that needed vetting. Um, so fast forward, it's my son. I was actually gowned and gloved in a patient room when my son called my phone about six times to let me know that Biden had officially won. It was a Saturday afternoon. Um, and um, about two weeks later, I was in my office at Mass General. I was actually in my chair's office. We were having a meeting and I got a voice message saying uh, Ron Klain called with the 202 area code. And I thought, I know that name. <laughs> um, I called first my husband and I said, Ron Klain called. And he said, whatever he asks, don't say no. Um, That's a good husband. <laughs> he was a good husband. He's a, he's a great husband. Um, but he knew that I would be like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> right, CDC? Um, so I actually anticipated it would be a job in Washington. I didn't anticipate it would be a job in Atlanta. That might have even been a little easier for me. My family's in Washington. I know Washington pretty well. Um, but he called and said, would you consider a job as chief chair director of the CDC? Um, and so I said, I would have to think about it. <laughs> um, and um, then the vetting started. And I mean, the have to think about it is a real thing because, you know, this is a tough, tough job, but also a job that had been caught a little bit in the political crosshairs in prior administrations and prior periods of history. And certainly we saw how politicized COVID was already becoming at that point, right? So was it was this, a lot in the political crosshairs. Right. So this must have been a moment of big trepidation too, right, to some extent? Um, Yes. I mean, I everybody had who I had talked to about it, and I didn't talk to very many people had said this is going to be the hardest job you ever will have. Um, and while that did give me pause, I think the thing that kind of took me over was somebody think uh, thinks I'm the right person for the job in this moment. And there was this um, call to service in, you know, and what I said in my nomination speech was when you are the chief resident in the ICU and your code pager goes off, you answer the code, whether you think you're prepared for whatever it will be. Um, and it felt like at 4,000 deaths a day, the country was coding. And somebody called and said, your code pager is going off, you answer the code. Okay, so you're now at the CDC. So you've had this huge change in perspective from looking at the agency and its directors from the outside to now being in Atlanta and being on the inside. Mm -hmm. Any reflections on how the public gets things wrong about the agency or what you, even a very informed person about the agency, didn't really know from the outside that you saw moving to the inside? Yeah, I mean, I think of the agency in a couple of different ways. First is prior to the prior administration, it, CDC is and was the gold standard for all things infectious disease. It was a site that, I mean, if I put C in my Google search bar, CDC came up. That's the place that we went for all sorts of surveillance data. Where are we? What is our sexually transmitted infection outbreak status? What, you know, that's where we went. Um, as an infectious disease doc, I went there mostly for infectious disease related statistics and policies and, and guidances and recommendations. But um, I knew it to be much broader scope. The prior administration, um, tarnish that a bit. And um, so that was really a challenge because I always knew it to be the gold standard. But what was happening is under the prior administration, the logo was being used for things that sort of the agency and its incredible people didn't stand for. And that was a real challenge. So when I got to CDC, I saw the great people who were there. I saw the people who I knew um, whose voices wanted to be heard. Um, it was a tough place from a morale standpoint. Um, I recall an anecdote that somebody told me that he said he doesn't go to the supermarket and tell people he works at CDC. I recall somebody telling me that they were told by security to scrape off their parking stickers on their car for fear of vandalism. So it was a really tough place, despite the fact that it was full of 13,000 public servants who are really doing their best um, to convey the science in really difficult and challenging times. 
The size and scope of what CDC does, um, I I knew it existed, but it was really incredible to see firsthand. So um, the country knew of COVID and the CDC's mark in what it did in COVID. Um, but there were so many other infectious diseases that were even sent my direction during my tenure COVID, MPOX, two Marburg outbreaks in, in around the world, one, one um, Ebola outbreak in, in Mubende, Uganda, a new paralytic polio case, several measles outbreaks, 63 foodborne outbreaks. I could go on and on, a blastomycosis outbreak in Michigan. So that is what we did that nobody really even heard about because it didn't, we tackled those, right? Um, the other thing I think people don't realize are twofold. One is all of our incredible, the CDC's incredible work in the non-infectious space, maternal mortality, opioids, um, uh, firearm violence, mental health, um, tobacco cessation, cardiovascular disease, cancer screening. All of those things are a really important part of what we do at CDC. And then finally, the global piece. We have a presence, in, an active presence in 60 countries. I visit at our team in Uganda that has over 100 people working there, which is why we were able to work so much on the ground in, the, um, with, in Mubende when the Ebola outbreak happened. So the, the size scope of what CDC does, the number of offices around the country, um, was really just extraordinary and, and um, fun for me to watch. You're absolutely right that I think because so much of the attention focused on COVID for understandable reasons, that it's very easy to lose track of how broad the mission of the CDC is and has been, right? Not just in the United States, but globally. And I think, what, you know, the the curse of public health in terms of funding is that it's only known about when when it it fails. Um, so the one of the incredible examples that I like to give is during Operations Allies Welcome, 80,000 Afghanis were brought to the United States. Um, all of them needed medical screening. None of them spoke English. All of them needed medical screening. And in that medical screening, I believe there were 44 active measles cases um, that didn't get into the community. I mean, there was active tuberculosis, active syphilis, active hepatitis A. Um, none of those got into the, into the communities because of the incredible work of people at the CDC. Now, I can say this because I'm a law professor from the outside, right? So nobody's going to take umbrage if I say, which is to say, we also have a form of public health federalism in this country that I think does nobody any favors in the sense that people think of the CDC as very powerful, but actually a lot of the implementation work and a lot of the policy work is given to local and state governments such that in the early days of COVID, we saw huge variations in policy and the like. It must be very challenging to run a federal agency where everybody's focused on you, but you know that actually a lot of what, whether it'll go right or wrong, will be about the partnership with state and local governments. Um, yes. Thank you so much for saying that. So, you know, what I have frequently said is we have the responsibility, but not the power. And one of those is really manifested in data. Um, I think people just fail to recognize, headline after headline reads, CDC is going to not report, or CDC didn't report, or CDC didn't tell us. And I keep saying, does CDC have the data to report? Um, CDC receives data from 3,300 counties, 50 states, nine big cities, five territories, and 574 tribes. Um, and they come all in voluntarily. Um, they come in in a not standardized fashion. And so one can imagine if one decides to report one way versus another, um, some of them come in in antiquated version ways like fax machine. And um, so that is some of the work that we really need to do because you are right, it is, it is really hard to run a response to be um, to, when you know those data exist, you know you could make a better decision if you had those data, and yet you don't. Um, MPOX was actually a key example here. We had our first case of MPOX reported here in Massachusetts in, on May 17th. Um, we had our peak number of cases on August 1st. We, had, we know this in retrospect. We had the public health emergency declared on August 4th. That's amazingly quick. And, right. And... Um, with that public health emergency, we then took a month with many lawyers to navigate data use agreements on how and when vaccines were delivered and administered. And we got those agreements signed around September 1. So how can we be fast when we can't even see the data until a month after our peak number of cases? 
So we heard a little bit about the challenges about implementing the policy at a local and state level. I don't want to ask you in the other direction, which is the global piece. So mm -hmm. as you described with Ebola, with other outbreaks, there's so much going on that the CDC does globally. Can you tell us a little bit about that piece? Yeah, I mean, we have we have um, offices in 60 different countries and in six different regions, and those regions are actually expanding. And that is really key and critically important for global health security globally, as well as here in this country. Um, when we work with our international partners and our offices, some of our offices are over 25 years old, um, we really have partnership. We have locally employed staff, um, and we have subject matter expertise, and we have field, we call them FETPs, field epidemiology training programs, where we are doing the work to um, to develop the local staff so that this is really a partnership where the ultimate goal, of course, would be to put ourselves out of business in that country. Um, but they have developed all of the skill sets and laboratory and technical expertise that they need um, such that our presence is no longer needed there. Um, but we work, it's incredible to visit to visit these countries. I have the great gift of being able to visit some of them and to see that partnership in action. I met um, a 20 some odd year old gentleman who works at the Uganda-Congo border. Um, he had been trained by our CDC staff and he had recognized a woman and her baby who had left the Congo um, and had signs and symptoms of Ebola. Um, as he screened her, he uh, isolated her and her baby, and she, in fact, succumbed to Ebola, but he probably saved an outbreak of Ebola in that country. Um, and so you see that work and the impact um, on the ground, saving that, that country, but then also potentially saving a global scare. So we're at Harvard Law School. I would be remiss if I didn't <laughs> ask you a little about the role of lawyers here and lawsuits. So, you know, I just finished a book, uh, editing a book with some others on COVID-19 and the law. Of course, uh, there's always going to be a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking on this. But as you were in the role, to what extent did thinking about lawsuits, thinking about litigation affect kind of the decision making you were doing? And how does that interplay work? Um, so I'm a trained physician um, and epidemiologist. My my North Star was, what is the right thing to do for health um, in this moment? We then always had to understand what is the policy impact of that. And maybe everyone doesn't consider health the most important um, parameter that they're trying to make a decision under. Um, and we needed to understand where the law was going to fit in, where were we going to be potentially at risk of the law, um, and where the law might not be on our side, um, and especially if and when it was the right thing to do um, in a public health emergency. So um, I found myself, it's actually why I'm here this semester, I frequently found myself on a Zoom screen of an ID doc and six lawyers. <laughs> um, and so I really thought, and, and I really do believe that sort of magic happens at this intersection of disciplines. And so I learned a lot from my legal colleagues. Um, I, I would like to say that they learned something from me as well. Um, and it was always part of the discussion, but not necessarily the most important part of the discussion. Fortunately, um, when we had these conversations, we could get to the why. Why do we need to be in this space? And where is the gray zone where the law will help support our, our cause for what we need to do? You're very gracious to say magic is what happens when you're surrounded by six lawyers. We'll often use a different word, but that's very kind of you. So, you know, while lawyers sometimes think of themselves as all powerful, we're certainly not all powerful. But it is true the law has a big role to play in the public's health. We've talked a little about this in terms of COVID, but I want to just give you an opportunity to say a little bit about how you see law playing out and law's effect in other public health domains. Yeah, this is a really important question. And I think people don't necessarily recognize how ingrained these laws are and how it can affect other, other infectious threats, for example. So I spent 25 years of my career working in the field of HIV. Right now, that HIV epidemic in this country is generally focused on black gay men of the South. That's where we see the most. Um, and when you think about the policies in the areas where we have the hardest challenges, um, it is sexual health and learning in the elementary schools. It is um, 
uh, incarceration laws. So many black men in those states are incarcerated. It is their inability to vote after they come out. It is their inability to access meds. Um, it is with incarceration, there's a lot of concurrency of same of many different partners at once um, in those communities. Um, it is lack of Medicaid expansion. So inability to get meds. So when you put all of those together, it is not a surprise that that is where the epidemic is concentrated. And so I think that when you when we think about these policies, we really do need to understand. And as an infectious disease doc, I will say um, infectious diseases tend to hit the vulnerable. Um, with COVID, it was people who could travel on airplanes and travel on cruise ships who brought it here. And then it quickly went to people who are, who are vulnerable. So we will see this with infectious disease threat after infectious disease threat. All right, I'm going to ask you now a little bit about how CDC sits within uh, the administrative law context of the HHS as a you know department in general, and that you are one sub-agency. There's other players. There's FDA. There's CMS, of course. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about what the relationship is like from a day-to-day -day level? Yeah, I mean, so much of the work that we needed to do, it's its a passing the baton. So much of the work around HHS was passing the baton. If we take this action, you're going to need to pick it up with this action. And how is that all going to piece together so it served the American people well? So we had frequent conversations. I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with other agency heads. We did a lot of meetings, especially around when a new policy would come up. So for example, um, when there would be a new vaccine or a new booster that would be either authorized or approved, what was the implication? What was the action that FDA was going to take? What was a follow-up action that we at CDC were going to take? Where did HRSA need to integrate with the federally qualified health centers and then Medicare, Medicaid, and CMS? So it it really was a finely tuned, uh, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of baton passing and a lot of integration. And I, I just had a great gift of working with amazing people while I was there. So you talked a lot about making decisions under conditions of uncertainty, which was the reality of the COVID-19 pandemic, really for all of us, but also for government officials. When you look back at your time as CDC director, you said, you know, one or two do-overs that you could have again or decisions you could make differently. Is there anything that comes to mind in particular? Um, I learned a lot about communications. Um, I think people don't necessarily realize that I came to the agency and the director of communications position had been empty for four years. Wow. Um, so you can imagine stepping into a position where we were doing three times a week press conferences um, without a communications director. I had amazing people working in the acting role, and that was wonderful, um, but it didn't have the stability of a communications director. Um, I will also say that because the prior administration was not actually putting the best agency face forward, I will say, there was a lot of... Um, other ways that communication was happening, not through standard processes. And so a lot of leaks were happening, leaks of early documents, leaks of things. And, and that disturbed me a lot. I came from a background where we, like, we, we had HIPAA constraints, right? Like linking doesn't happen. And so it really disturbed me when I came in that there wasn't that trust there, that that linking didn't happen. And I, that really bothered me early on. It probably bothered me more than it should. Um, and so among the things, I will say in sort of the major big pictures where we had to make decisions under uncertainty, there were places that we had to pivot and I stand by where we had to pivot because the science and the virus changed. Um, in the big pictures as we made those decisions, I feel like scientifically, we generally did the right thing and science was on our, like science always was on our side. Um, the challenge was how we, how we communicated some of that. And so, especially after doing our agency review in April, of 22, where I really heard the importance of partnerships. Um, I think probably my biggest challenge was in when we removed the masks in May of 2021. Um, I was so worried about the leaking that I sort of was less worried about the partnerships and I should have, I should have reversed that. I should have been more worried about how are people going to implement this on the ground if you so quickly take off masks, um, rather than being worried that, that somebody was gonna say it first. I wanna switch now to think a little bit about the trajectory of public health, right? So we're at a period where I think trusts and in institutions in the United States is not at an all time low, quite a low. And also to some extent, trust in public health is trust in medicine and medical authorities, right? 
Do you see us on a trajectory where that gets better? Do you see us on a trajectory where that gets worse? How do you think the future is going to unfold on this topic of public health? I'm deeply worried about it. Um, I do think that it is very it is very hard to challenge when somebody can considers their their fact a fact when in fact it is not a fact um and we have to understand that science evolves and science we will learn more every day and this is the state of the science and that this paper that has been heavily vetted in nature or new england journal probably has way more credibility than your white paper that you refuse to put authors on right um so and that's but the people are sort of counting them as the same um, um, we also are in a time where science is now being put out there in med archive prior to peer review and that always that allows it allows it to get out faster but it's not fully vetted and so i think we're in a, a really interesting time but i do worry about um, conveying truths and the trust in health and public health and i think part of that too is while cdc um, has the name and the federal recognition, as you talked about, its effector arms, which is state and local health departments, do not have, have not had the resources. They've been incredibly frail in terms of the resources that they've had to operate. People have estimated that the public health workforce is about 80,000 in deficit. Um, I mentioned our data systems that still come in, you know, you can order a Starbucks by QR code, but the data systems come in by fax machine in this country. So there's something that's backwards about that. Even our laboratory systems, if you go to a state-of-the-art laboratory and then you go to our la state lab here, we have, we have great people working in those labs and a lot of infrastructure, but our labs across the country really need more infrastructure. So I think um, there is the trust component and then the fact that we do need investments because um, forgetting that it is those effector arms that are doing some really hard work to support CDC, I think um, will be a disservice to us. So it's interesting you talk about this lack of resources. I often tell people that when it comes to COVID-19, although it was a terrible pandemic, there were many ways in which we were very lucky, including the speed with which we got these vaccines, like unprecedented if you compare it to prior vaccination yeah. efforts, right? Oh, by years. By years. If you think about the next pandemic that might be coming our way, it's, it's doing not a crossover or whatever it is, what would you like to see the powers that be, whether that's Congress, the state governments, uh, philanthropic funding, global health funding, what would you like to see us do in a ramp up the next five years, let's say, to try to be more prepared? It is that infrastructure. Um, and because I think that we, there's a lot that needs to be done, both in the investments of the public health infrastructure. Let's face it, three years ago was a time that was too painful for us to want to recall and want to remember. But we will be back to that if we um, are, have, another, have another infectious threat because we haven't fixed all the data, the, the systems that need to be fixed. Um, I, I have said before, we anticipated a 100 year influenza pandemic. Um, we didn't get it, we got COVID and they're not mutually exclusive. So it is the case that we still have, you know, influenza risk and other, other global zoonotic risks. Um, our data systems, we made massive investments in our data systems, um, over a billion dollars in, um, in investments. There are single health departments that need that kind of, those kinds of resources. Single health systems spend more than that to convert to Epic. Single health systems. So when you think about that investment for the entire country, when uh, COVID started, we had 187 um, healthcare facilities that were able to electronically report data to the CDC. By the time I left, that was 25,000. Um, so those investments have gone a really long way. And that's about 25% of the health systems in the country. So we still have a lot of work to do. You know, HLS stands for Harvard Law School, but I often think it's about Harvard Leadership School too. We tried to prepare a generation of leaders, right? What was it like stepping into an agency where morale was low? And what did you learn about leadership? And what lessons about leadership do you think you could tell us a little bit about that you might pay forward? Um, yeah, this was this was this was not the public challenge. This was the challenge within the agency. Um, so morale was really low, really, really low. We talked a little bit about some of the challenges, people not wanting to even claim that they worked there. Um, and so there were several things that I did to start. One was I met one-on-one -on -one with my division, with my center leaders, but then I did what I called skip 
meetings and went one level down and met one on one with, I think, 120 division directors, many of whom said they had never met with a CDC director before. So just trying to touch people one on one and to say, if you ever need me, knock on my door or send me an email, I will be here for you. Um, so that was one thing, these skip meetings and trying to touch more people. The second thing, which was um, the right thing to do, although I didn't necessarily think it would improve morale in the way that it did, was declaring racism a serious public health threat. Um, we, this was, I think it was April 6th that we made that announcement. So I was just 10 weeks into the job. Um, CDC had received a letter that my predecessor had received a letter saying they thought CDC was a racist place um, and that hadn't been acted on. Um, and we were actively trying to get vaccines to socially vulnerable communities. So it all aligned. It was the important message to send. Since then, 200 public health departments have done the same thing, which is really incredible. And it mobilized people who were really down um, to work to this common cause. Um, and they were already working super hard and they would put in extra hours to try and see what they could do there. So it was really a mobilizing, morale boosting announcement um, that I didn't recognize at the time would boost morale. So one other thing maybe I'll just mention that I did was I did um, what I called unsung hero calls. Um, I had my team, people know CDC for the epidemiology that we do, the science that we do, but I had my team give me five names a week of people who had just gone above and beyond. Um, and um, I called them on the phone and, you know, it's an agency of 13,000. You don't necessarily think that five names a week, you're wow. going to, you're going to make a difference. But I talked to the woman who stayed up all night to book airline flights for people who deployed to Operations Allies Welcome Sites. I spoke to the person who knocked on doors at the Iowa Ohio train derailment. Or, um, you know, those kinds of things, people who, who's, um, they're the, soft or the connective tissue of what makes the the agency work um all the logistics people who who were deployed to the border it was um it was really meaningful to me to really understand the span and scope of what the agency was doing um i had people in tears when i called them they saying they'd never spoken to a director i asked them to thank their teams um and that actually you know it touched way more people than five a week so I know that uh, I think it was in April 2022, you did a review of the CDC as an agency. Tell me a little bit about that process, but also the results and what the findings were and what you thought about it. Um, yeah, I felt like finally by that time we had, we, this was at the end of Omicron or at the end of that big Omicron surge, it was time to sort of put the mirror up and to do some tough love and say, the agency has been around for 76 years, never before in the time of a pandemic. What did we learn? What did we do really well? And what are things that we need to do better and prepare ourselves for? Um, communication was a key piece of that. Um, moving our data and science faster was also a key piece. The, the agency is well known for moving science and, and its academic work that it does. But in public health um, emergencies, we need to move our data faster. And sometimes that means we have to put it out there before the ink is dry on the paper. We need to put it out on, on our website or in white paper form to say, this is what we know now and we're gonna take policy action right now. So we needed to move it faster. We needed to change our guidance so it read more for the American people. Um, the, most people hadn't heard of the CDC, and therefore people who came to our website were not the American people. It was, it was um, epidemiologists and healthcare providers. But increasingly, the American people were coming to our school guidance. And so you will see over time that the, how those read were markedly different. Um, we had 200,000 web pages on our CDC wow. website, um, and we really needed to call those down. We needed to, you know, have the language be more accessible language, and we needed to maybe um, uh, sunset some websites, but also put some websites in places where others could find them, um, archive them, but, but not have them as our forefront. We needed to be a better partner. Um, we needed to listen more than we were talking sometimes. Um, and that was really important. And then we need a public health workforce that's ready to respond. So we learned that, you know, if there's a foodborne outbreak, we can send a dozen investigators to that foodborne outbreak. 
During COVID, we had 2,500 people at the CDC working um, in an outbreak and um, on our response, and we needed to have everybody able to work in a response. So those were some of the really important themes that we heard and part of what we initiated in a process of moving forward to say, these are all the things that we need to do. Some of the things are outside of CDC's control, and we, we did make a list and published a list of some of the authorities that we need. Um, we talked about the federalism component that we need. If we did all of this really hard work at the agency, we still couldn't do everything that we needed to do because we didn't have authorities, human resource authorities and data authorities. So, so we, it was a really comprehensive piece of work that I think is really important in action being taken. So we've been lucky to have you here at Harvard Law School and the Petrie Flom Center. You also have connections with other parts of the university this year. What's it been like coming back to an academic institution after this very high pressure, difficult, but also fulfilling job? Um, well, it's been extraordinarily fun. This is sort of, you know, I consider Harvard my home, although I am not in sort of my home space. Um, and so while it's it feels it feels homey, it is still a bit foreign for me. And that's actually was by design. It was intentional. Um, it's really fun for me to work at the intersection. We talked about this, the intersection of disciplines. Um, and so as I think about, and it's been fun for me to work with students. I love working with students and and mentoring and sort of paying that forward. Um, as I think about what's next, I still don't know. Um, I'm still sort of doing, I'm in the exploratory phase, but I will say that some of the problems that really plague me are our data system problems in this country, um, because I do think we as a health system and a public health system need to have more intersection and our workforce um, challenges, both in the public health workforce and in the healthcare workforce. And so um, I intend in whatever I do to help work on and think about those problems, um, and I don't exactly exactly know what shape that'll look like just yet. Of course, COVID-19 is still with us. And of course, the challenges for public health are very much with us. If you could leave the American public with one message or one thought, what would it be? Just one. <laughs> First, it was just a gift and an honor of a lifetime to be able to serve in that role. Um, I will say that we have not been very good as a country about protecting one another during periods of this public health crisis. We've had several public health crises and so much of what we do, I think, in public health is to work to improve not only our own individual health, but the health of our community and to protect one another. And then to be um, critical about the places that you get your information and your data and making sure that they are um, scientifically correct and they are actually working in your favor. Dr. Walensky, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me here at Petrie Farm.